Hello everybody, my name is Uzair Hashmi and for my profile details, please visit skadia.com. In today's lecture, we are going to discuss about uh, the regulation of extracellular fluid osmo osmolarity and its relationship with the sodium concentration. So basically, we are going to discuss how the sodium concentration regulates uh, along with the extracellular fluid, its osmolarity and we're going to discuss the factors that are involved in it. So let's have a look at the lecture's outline. We're going to start off with the introduction and we're going to discuss in that uh, the kidney that excrete excess water by forming a dilute urine, of course. And dilute urine will only be formed uh, when there is excessive amount of uh, water in the body fluid. So when the amount of excessive, uh, in the presence of excessive amount of water, there is a specific hormone that pituitary uh, gland, posterior pituitary gland in the hypothalamus secretes that is known as the antidiuretic hormone, also known as the vasopressin. Now this hormone in the presence of excessive amount of water is not being excreted. Now, because it's not being secreted, so a dilute urine will be formed. In case of the renal, uh, in case of, uh, we will be discussing about the renal mechanisms for excreting a dilute urine. How from a region of uh, proximal tubule to the distal tubule to the loop of Henle and the collecting tubules, uh, what kind of mechanisms are there for the excretion of a dilute urine? And what are the factors that play important role in that? We're going to discuss the hyperosmotic conditions uh, of the renal interstitial fluid. We're going to discuss how important, how the uh, in hyperosmotic conditions are formed and what are the main important solutes that are responsible for initiation or the generation of uh, the hyperosmotic conditions. After that, we are going to discuss the what are the factors, the key factors and the key players that contribute towards the establishment of the hyperosmotic conditions. After discussing, discussing the roles and the factors involved in the establishment of hyperosmotic conditions, we are going to discuss stepwise. What are the different uh, steps that are involved which cause the hyperosmotic um, conditions in specifically in the renal medullary cord interstitial and then we are going to discuss uh, how the urea uh, plays its important function or plays its part in establishing or uh, increasing the hyperosmotic uh, renal medullary interstitial after that we are going to discuss a very uh, in a very we'll give a very small touch uh, to the disorders of the urinary concentrating ability. We have basically diabetes, insipidus. We are going to discuss uh, the central diabetes insipidus and the nephrogenic diabetes insipidus. And we are going to discuss uh, how the demopressin, uh, which is basically an antagonist of a uh, which is basically the uh, analog of uh, the ADH hormones. It's a synthetic analog, acts on the V2 receptors of uh, the distal tubules and the collecting ducts to improve the disorder, to cure the disorder. Well, after that, we are going to discuss the osmoreceptors and the ADH feedback system. We are going to discuss uh, how the osmoregulators or the osmoreceptors uh, detect excessive or uh, limited amount of water uh, through the various mechanisms including blood volume and blood pressure. Uh, which basically increase or decrease the production of uh, antidiuretic hormone or vasopressin. We are going to discuss how the ADH synthesis uh, is being done and how and under what circumstances ADH is being released from the posterior pituitary. After that, we are going to discuss the cardiovascular reflex stimulation of the ADH release. Uh, of course, that also includes the variations in the uh, blood pressure and variations of the blood volume. Uh, we are going to discuss what role the thirst play in controlling the extracellular fluid osmolarity, number one, and in controlling the concentration of sodium ions. So let's get started. 
So, of course, it's, a, it's an established fact that the total concentration of solute in the extracellular fluid, how are you going to determine its concentration? You're going to determine its concentration uh, by the amount of solute uh, divided by the volume of the extracellular fluid. How much solute is present in the uh, extracellular fluid under a specific volume? So uh, that particular concentration is regulated by the amount of water and the amount of water is regulated in turn but and that particular uh, body water is being controlled by two things. Number one is the fluid intake and the fluid intake is regulated by the thirst. Number one, that number two is the renal excretion of water. Now this particular renal excretion of water is uh, controlled by enormous amount of factors, various factors, some of the factors play key role uh, that influence of course starting from the glomerular filtration uh, towards the tumular reabsorption and uh, various different hormones also play an important role in that including the angiotensin uh, to uh, aldosterone antidiuretic hormone. So, uh, in this lecture, we are going to discuss what are the mechanisms, the mechanisms which causes kidney to eliminate excess water. And that excess water is excreted out in the form of dilute urine. And then after that, we are going to discuss how kidney changes, it adapts itself, uh, adapts uh, to the changes uh, that basically occurs in the absence of excess amount of water and resulting in the formation of concentrated urine. Then we are going to discuss about the renal uh, feedback mechanisms and that uh, these renal feedback mechanisms and we will be going to discuss how these mechanisms control the extracellular fluid concentrations specifically of sodium and its corresponding osmolarity. After that we are going to discuss how the thirst and the soil appetite mechanisms are there in the body to determine the intakes of both water and salt. And both of these play an important role to control the extracellular fluid volume along with its osmolarity and the concentration of sodium ions. So starting off with the kidney uh, and how it excretes excess water by the formation of urine. So in the presence of excess amount, amount of water, uh, the osmolarity of the water will be of course low osmolarity of the body fluid will be low because the water will cause the osmolarity to decrease. So what uh, what happens in that particular scenario is that urine will be excreted of low osmolarity because excess body fluid is present so no ADH will be released when no ADH or the antidiuretic hormone will be released there will be no reabsorption of water from the distal, tubule, distal tubular portion and when the water won't be reabsorbed from the distal tubular portion, the water will be excreted out uh, in the form of dilute urine and hence when the urine will be dilute, it means that the osmolarity or the solute concentration will be low and it will be low to as low as 50 milliosmoles. The water deficiency, we'll be discussing about what happens where in, the casing, uh, in the case of water deficiency. Well, well, in cases, in the scenario, when the intake of the water is low and the body fluid concentration, the uh, body fluid is, the volume of the body fluid is decreased, it means that the water is not being intaken in the amount that is being required for the normal intake. So what happens in that particular scenario is the high osmolarity concentration. The high osmolarity will, of course, send signal uh, for the release of the antidiuretic hormone to be released so that uh, it's basically a control mechanism. For, for example, if you have something in excess quantities, uh, so you won't worry about its depletion, right? So what happens, you know, what would happen when that particular quantity, when that particular uh, substance that you have in abundant quantity starts to deplete and there will come a time when you will feel that it will be run short of if uh, that particular uh, substance uh, is not being stored. So similar mechanisms occur in the body and these mechanisms account for the reabsorption of the water in the case when the water is deficient in the body. 
So in that particular scenario, ADH is being released. It stimulates the V2 receptors and these V2 receptors causes the reabsorption of water, water from both the distal tubules and the collecting tubules. Now this reabsorption of water results in the concentration of the urine that is the, because the volume of the urine is being low and there will come a time when the urine will be secreted in a very concentrated manner and at that particular point the osmolarity of the urine would be as high as 1200 milliosmoles per liter. Now, of course, uh, this ability to regulate the water excretion is very important as and it is independent of the solute excretion. Now, this ability to regulate the water uh, excretion independently of the solute excretion is very vital and very plays a very vital and a necessary role uh, for the survival. Then this is especially uh, the case when the fluid intake is minimized. That is only the solute will be released to a particular quantity where there will be where there will be no effect on the solute minimization along with the water uh, uh, storage. Now talking about the antidiuretic hormones specifically in this particular slide, the antidiuretic hormones control the urine concentration. Now there is a powerful feedback mechanism for regulating the plasma osmolarity along with its sodium concentration and it operates by either altering the renal excretion of water or uh, by independently controlling the rate of solute excretion. So basically uh, what happens in that particular scenario is that I have basically give, have given you an overview in the previous slides as well. So uh, either the renal excretion of water will be released now will be shortened down or the rate of solute excretion will be altered. So it is secreted in, the re in cases of high osmolarity and uh, high osmolarity is indicative of the factor that the water is deficient. So the, there is a need uh, for the body to restore or to store water to avoid uh, the conditions uh, where the, uh, dehydration can occur. So the posterior pituitary glands, what happens is that it will start to secrete more and more uh, ADH or the vasopressin. And of course, this will in turn increase the permeability of the distal tubules and the collecting tubules to reabsorb water into the lumen. Thus, antidiuretic hormones plays very vital functions. Uh, this allows of course the large amount of water to be reabsorbed number one along with the decreased urine volume now let's read through this particular slide because there is nothing important to discuss so when there is excess water in the body and the extracellular fluid the osmolarity is reduced so it's an established fact that when you have let's say enormous amount abundant amount of water in the body so the amount of uh, uh, let's say the amount of solutes, let's say sodium ions or the chlorine or chloride ions or the calcium or the magnesium or, uh, ions or the potassium ions, they will be uh, reduced because uh, uh, let's say you have a one gram of salt that is dissolved in 10 ml of water. So it will have a specific concentration. But when you will add 90 uh, milliliters more of water, so this would decrease its concentration because at that particular time the concentration of uh, salt was 1 mg per 10 ml now it would be 0.1 mg per 10, uh, 10 ml because you have added 90 more ml of water so it would be 1 mg per 100 ml or 0.1 mg per 10 ml so its concentration reduced to 10 folds when the water was added to 10 folds so this similarly this happens when there is excess amount, abundant amount of water the osmol osmolarity of the solutes ha has been decreased. So the secretion of ADH or the antidiuretic hormones plays a very vital role to the pituitary. A posterior pituitary basically it will decrease of course in the presence of abundant amount of water this uh, this abundant amount of water will uh, be detected by the osmoreceptors and they will send signals to the pituitary hormone that you uh, have to stop the secretion of ADH because uh, of course 
uh, the there is excess amount of water that is present in the body so it first needs to be excreted out before you start secreting the antidiuretic hormone of course it will uh, ultimately cause the large amounts of urine to be excreted out of course after that the rate of ADH secretion will determine whether the kidney is going to secrete a concentrated urine or a dilute urine so up till now it's been established that ADH plays the determining role in uh, fi in finalizing that the kidney is going to secrete either a concentrated urine or a dilute urine in the presence of water deficient quantities or the water abundant uh, scenarios respectively now we are going to discuss uh, what happens uh, if you will drink one liter of water so here in this particular diagram you can see that uh, as a result of uh, intake of one liter of water the osmolarity will decrease and osmolarity will decrease because this particular uh, line showing uh, in the dotted form in the red color shows the plasma osmolarity so at that particular scenario the osmolarity the tubular osmolarity was at this particular uh, point between 400 to 800 around 600 milliosmoles per liter so as you decreased one liter of water this amount of uh, osmolarity decreased this amount of osmolarity decreased to many many above than uh, zero that is around 100 or 150 milliosmoles per liter so when when this point will occur at uh, this particular point the urine flow will increase the urine flow will increase to maintain or to ensure that uh, the excess amount of water that you have you know taken in uh, as it is uh, from uh, the oral route this uh, intake is minimized and this may intake is minimized by the urine flow that is in that particular amount when the uh, osmolarity was around 600 milliosmoles uh, the urine flow was about uh, 1 ml per minute but as you drank uh, one liter of water the osmolarity decreases uh, to around 150 milliosmoles from 600 milliosmoles so this will shoot the flow of urine flow rate from 1 ml per minute to around to more than around uh, 6 ml per minute and this will remain the same until the osmolarity of uh, the tubular osmolarity is retained so as you can see there is a shoot again in the urine osmolarity the urine flow rate will start to decrease and at a particular time uh, the urine flow rate will be resumed as the initial rate only when the urine osmolarity is resumed at, uh, at the initial stage when before or prior to drinking one liters of water so in both of these scenarios, uh, the urinary solute concentrations remains almost the same. So uh, here in this particular slide, we're going to discuss the different renal mechanisms uh, and these renal mechanisms for excreting a dilute urine. Now here you can see over here that we have a glomerulus, glomerular filtrate and the filtrate will occur at this particular case. Now from the tubular portion, the sodium will be excreted out, uh, will be reabsorbed along with the water and this water will be reabsorbed through the tight junctions that are present at the proximal portions of the epithelial, tubular epithelial. So now this would leave the osmolarity to about 300 milliosmoles. Now it will move down through the descending loop of Henle. This descending loop of Henle in over here, the water will be reabsorbed back. Now this reabsorption of the water will of course increase the osmolarity, increase the concentration. And it will increase from 300 milliosmoles to 400 milliosmoles. As it will be moved down the uh, loop of Henle to the sending loop of Henle, here you can see that the osmolarity will of course increase to 600 milliosmoles and this 600 milliosmoles will be uh, due to the continuous reabsorption of the water down the loop of Henle. 
Now what would happen is that over here you can see that 600 milliosmolarity milliosmoles osmolarity is present in the tubular epithelium which is in harmony or which is in uh, equilibrium with the extra cellular fluid osmolarity that is again 600. So when it will starts to move, it, it will starts to ascend upward in the ascending loop of Henle. The sodium chloride reabsorption would taken would be taking place, and it will decrease the osmolarity from 600 to 400 milliosmoles. As it will move upside, if you could remember, I discussed in the previous lecture that this thick ascending loop of Henle portions account for the 25% reabsorption of the sodium ions or the sodium chloride ions. Now, these active pumps will be responsible for uh, the reabsorption of the sodium chloride or the sodium ions out from that thick ascending loop portion. Now this thick ascending loop of portion after being sodium chloride being reabsorbed will decrease the osmolarity from 400 milliosmoles to about 100 milliosmoles. Now this again is uh, managed by the active uh, uptake of the sodium chloride from the distal tubular portion well, and over here at this particular case the extracellular osmolarity will be about 300 but intracellular would be about 300 uh, milliosmoles per liter. Now it will go deep down the osmolarity will keep on decreasing from 100 to 70 uh, milliosmoles per liter. Uh, over here this decrease is because of the action of the antidiuretic hormone where uh, it uh, either alters the secretion of water but in the presence of abundant quantities of the water uh, this sodium ion uh, secretion will of course be taking place and this secretion from 100 to 70 this decrease in the milliosmolarity from 100 to 70 is again because the sodium chloride active pump has taken out the sodium and this sodium has decreased the osmolarity from 100 to 70 and from 70 to 50 this gradual decrease of osmolarity of sodium is because of the sodium reabsorption that is occurring uh, both at the distal tubule at the distal portion and from the collecting portion of the tubule both in the cortex and the medullary portion now let's discuss the kidney how kidney conserves water by excreting concentrated urine now, uh, it's an established fact if you study the physiologic anatomy of a body that uh, water is continuously lost and uh, the body is able to continuously lose water to regulate a variety of different functions and this water loss is through various routes. Number one is, the, is through the lungs by the evaporation into the expired air when, through the, during the process of exhalation. You can see water vapors uh, at particular scenario when the water vapors are being condensed whenever you exhale you can see those water vapors if you exhale let's say in front of a glass. Of course uh, through the this watery uh, loss is also through the gastrointestinal tract uh, and through by the way of feces. And this uh, loss is much more in the situations where the water reabsorption is not being taken place from the large intestine uh, in, in, which happens in these scenarios of uh, um, diarrhea or the gastroenteritis. The skin through the evaporation and the perspiration and the water is also lost through the skin to maintain or to regulate the body temperature for example a, uh, what this uh, the water evaporation will occur uh, during the extreme conditions or a hot uh, body temperatures because the evaporation causes cooling of course it's an established fact so evaporation occurs to regulate the body temperature because um, we are the warm-blooded animals so we have to regulate the body temperature around 98.5 or 98.6 degree fahrenheit and of course last but not the least the kidneys uh, through kidneys water is lost so in order to uh, you know minimize this water loss fluid intake is required now the kidney conserves water by, of course, it's uh, uh, 
the continuation of the previous uh, topic how the kidney conserves water by the excretion of the concentrated urine now what happens is that kidney form a small volume of concentrated urine now this small amount of uh, concentrated urine is required for the minimum uh, loss which basically minimizes the intake of fluid that is required to maintain homeostasis now this uh, concentrated urine plays a very important function uh, when uh, the water among when the water quantity is short or water is not supplied to the quantities that is normally required by the body so this comes uh, this leads us to discuss the obligatory urine volume now as the name indicates itself that the obligatory urine volume is a volume of uh, the urine that is an obligation what i mean by saying this is that this is the minimum volume that is required by a particular person to uh, excrete now this minimum volume of the urine that must be excreted is known as the obligatory urine volume now for a particular person who is 70 kg and uh, who has to excrete about 600 milli osmoles of solute each day now he has the ability uh, now if we are going to discuss or determine what will be the obligatory urine volume so for a person who is 70 kg and who has to secrete 60 600 milliosmoles of solute each day he or she will be excreting about 0.5 liters of uh, the obligatory urine volume if the concentrating maximum urine concentrating ability is 1200 milliosmoles per liter so uh, the minimum amount of urine minimum amount of urine that will be excreted would be around 0.5 uh, liters of urine so what are the requirements we are going to discuss in this slide what are the requirements for the excretion of concentrated urine and these include number one is we is the requirement of high levels of ADH antidiuretic hormone now let's have uh, a look at what ADH does the ADH or the antidiuretic hormones well of course after after being released from the posterior pituitary of the hypothalamus it will be acting on the distal tubular portions and uh, along with the conducting ducts now after it's being act on both of these portions of the distal tubules and the collecting ducts it will be acting on the v2 receptors where it will of course increase the permeability of the collecting tubules and the distal portions of the tubules to reabsorb water when the water will be reabsorbed of course the quantity of water in the urine will be less the second factor is that plays very important functions is the high osmolarity of the renal medullary interstitial fluid now this high concentration is very important because when the sodium uh, has been reabsorbed back into the renal medullary interstitium the uh, osmolarity or the solute potential in the renal interstitium is much more than the solute potential in the tubular portion so water will be moving as a result of osmosis from a region of low solute potential to a region of high solute potential that is from tubular portions to the renal interstitial uh, to the renal medullary interstitial and this will of course occur and this movement will be much more high when the ADH is present now the counter current mechanism this is this process is the counter current mechanism and this uh, counter current mechanisms of the water reabsorption is dependent on the spatial anatomical arrangement of both the loop of Henle and the Vesarecta and along with that it is also dependent upon the specialized peritubular capillaries of the renal medulla now it's important to consider that the interstitial fluid osmolarity and the plasma osmolarity in normal situations are equal which is about 300 milliosmoles per liter the osmolarity in medulla is much more as compared to the interstitium and this uh, is uh, this varies from 1200 to 1400 milliosmoles per liter 
Now this osmolarity between the medulla and the interstitial fluid is maintained by a balanced inflow and outflow of both solutes and water in the medulla. Now this basically plays a vital role in the deciding factor and the deciding factor uh, about how and in what situations the hyperosmotic conditions will arise in both medulla and uh, this will of course return in the production of concentrated urine. So let's have a look first at the factors that contribute to the hyperosmotic conditions. Number one, of course, we discussed uh, is the active transport of the sodium uh, and the co-transport of uh, potassium and chloride <clears throat> from the thick ascending uh, limb portion of the loop of Henle into the medullary interstitium. So at that particular position in the medullary interstitium, the solid potential is much more high. So of course, it will cause the reabsorption of water. Uh, which will of course ultimately cause uh, the concentrated urine or the hyperosmotic conditions will produce. Along with that, the active transport of ions from the collecting tubules into the medullary interstitium will also increase, increase the medullary uh, hyperosmotic conditions because the solute potentials at that particular case, at that particular point will be much more higher as compared to the, its previous uh, destination so hyperosmotic conditions will arise as a result of active transport of ions from the collecting tubules along with that there is a process known as facilitated diffusion uh, which causes the movement of large amount of urea from the inner medullary portions uh, to the medullary interstitium. Now this movement is because of the high amount of uh, the urea that is present in the collecting, uh, collecting tubules. So what happens is that uh, the urea, it will be excreted out. It will be moved out from the tubular portion, collecting tubular portion into the medullary interstitium. This again will increase the hyperosmotic conditions. The fourth point is the diffusion of small amounts of water from the medullary tubules into the medullary interstitium. This is far less than the reabsorption of the solutes into the medullary interstitium. So uh, there is a very small amount of uh, water that is uh, that diffuses out because uh, water is present in abundantly high amount of quantities in the distant tubular portion. So water uh, is supposed to be uh, diffused out, but a very small, very small amount of water is diffused out as compared to the diffusion rate of the solutes. So let's discuss uh, what are the different seven steps that cause the hyperosmotic renal interstitial medulla. Now, uh, in order to discuss this particular, these steps, let's uh, let's assume that the interstitial fluid, uh, that the tubular fluid that is that passes through the loop of Henle and that passes through proximal and distal tubules and the collecting tubules over here is 300 milliosmoles. Now, at this particular situation, like I have discussed, that the osmolarity, that the osmolarity in the interstitial fluid is 300 but osmolarity increases in the medulla now you have to consider these two points and that the interstitial fluid osmolarity normally is 300 and medullary osmolarity is 1200 to 400 so we are going to discuss how this osmolarity of 300 milliosmoles per liter changes uh, in the medullary portions to uh, 1200 and 1400 so we have uh, a filtrate or the fluid that has the uh, osmolarity of 300 and it's passing through it. At this particular case, uh, both inside and outside, the osmolarity remains the same. When the fluid moves from the descending to the descending loop of Henle over here, uh, the sodium ions will be actively transported out. Now, when the sodium ions will be actively transported out, this will of course decrease the solute potential inside and hence the osmolarity will be decreased to about 200 milliosmoles per liter. Now, this uh, decrease in the osmolarity will be uh, countered by increase in the osmolarity because the sodium was being transported out into the uh, extracellular fluid, the osmolarity increase, increased 
from 300 to 400 milliosmoles per liter. As we move from step two to step three, we will see that as a result of increase in osmolarity of 400, there is basically a concentration, uh, a concentration gradient has been established that you can see over here that the osmolarity over here, that solute potential is over here is greater as compared to the solute potential over here. So in order to, uh, so what would happen, it would cause the movement of water molecule to move from here, from inside this portion to the outside, as you can see in this particular step. Now it would cause the constant, it would initiate the concentration of uh, the, uh, this particular fluid. Now what would happen is that at now the concentration has increased from uh, 300 to 400 at this particular case. Now, this happened because the water moved from inside to the outside as a result of increased osmolarity of the extracellular fluid. Now this increased osmo, uh, now this increased osmolarity of the fluid will of course move down the loop of Henle and when it moves from here to here, you can see again, what would happen? Well, this, that the, again, because over here, the sodium potassium pumps were present. So they had increased over here as well the movement of uh, sodium ions from inside to outside which of course increased the osmolarity of the extracellular fluid. So in step number five the same would happen. This 400 uh, os uh, milliosmolar fluid when moved from the sending loop of Henle these pumps present over here will cause the reabsorption or the excretion of uh, the sodium ions or the solutes outside. This will of course increase the extracellular fluid potential and when extracellular fluid potential will increase the water in this particular step will of course uh, be moved from inside to the outside as a result of osmosis. As a result of osmosis uh, because the water moved from inside to the outside so the water potential over here was also decreased. This decrease in the water potential will of course increase the solute potential and the osmolarity will increase up from 400 to 500. Now this steps from 4, 5, 6 is being repeated again and again and again and again up till a particular situation when the os osmolarity in the corticular portion or the interstitial portion reaches to 300 and in the medullary portion it reaches to around 1200. Now this produces the conditions of the hyperosmotic uh, renal medullary interstitium where the hyperosmotic uh, interstitium is present as a result of release of the sodium ions from the ascending loop of Henle which accounts for 25% of the uh, sodium reabsorption. Now this reabsorption resulted in establishment of the hyperosmotic interstitium. So up till now we discussed uh, what are uh, the different factors that are involved in the excretion of the dilute urine. We discussed about what, uh, how the antidiuretic hormone plays, uh, plays its role and we discussed about how this particular hyperosmotic conditions uh, arrives or establishes itself as a result of uh, sodium reabsorption or the solute reabsorption from the ascending thick loop of family. Now we're going to discuss uh, the role of the distal tubules in the excretion of concentrated urine. Now over here you can see uh, in this particular figure that the NACL has been excreted along with the water. This increased the concentration to 300. The water reabsorption uh, has been taken place which further increases to 1200. It decreases to about 600 over here. Uh, when the sodium chloride was uh, reabsorbed or excreted out, this further decreased to 100, and uh, this for, uh, this decrease in the 100 was uh, retained when the so when the antidiuretic hormones will act at this particular scenario when the uh, at this particular case at the cortical and the medullary portions of the loop of Henle. This action of the antidiuretic hormone will of course increase the uh, permeability of the duct 
and hence at this particular case the water will be reabsorbed back when the water will be reabsorbed back it will increase uh, the urine concentration by decreasing the urine volume so urine volume will be excreted in the very concentrated quantities and this will of course occurs only when the ADH or the antidiuretic hormones will be occurring uh, will be uh, playing its part by acting at the corticular and the medullary portions. Now also urea plays its important uh, role in the contribution of the renal medullary interstitium. Over here you can see the urea uh, is about 4.5% of the total osmolarity. Uh, as the water has been excreted its uh, concentration increased from 4.5 to 15 and as it keeps on increasing over here and over here uh, the water reabsorption has been taken place so the concentration of the urea is going to increase and over here 100% of the urea is present. Now as it moves down the collecting tubules because a very high concentration of urea is present so it will be diffused out. It, and it will be diffused out into the renal medullary interstitium. So when it will be diffused out of the renal interstitium, it will of course increase the solute potential as well. And this would of course result in the hyperosmotic conditions of the renal medullary interstitium. Now let's, let's read these four points that the high concentration of urea causes urea to diffuse out of the tubule into the renal interstitium. Of course, the diffusion from a region of high potential to the low potential will cause that. The diffusion is greatly facilitated by the urea transporter. Now over here, over here uh, specific uh, type of transporters known as the urea transporter, uh, among that UTA1 is one kind of the uh, transporter. This is basically activated by the ATH. When in the case of uh, antidiuretic hormone, uh, when antidiuretic hormone is being secreted out and it will be secreted in the case when the water is being deficient, so it has to restore water. So when the water has to be restored, the ADH is being released, which will at one hand cause the reabsorption of the water. At the second hand, it will increase the hyperosmotic conditions. And hyperosmotic conditions again in turn would cause the movement of water from the tubule, from the collecting tubules into the interstitium. And this will be done by the activation of UTA1 receptors, which will cause the diffusion of urea from collecting tubules into the renal interstitium, which will of course increase the hyperosmotic conditions. So two special features of the renal medullary blood flows plays an important role in establishment of hyperosmolarity. Number one is the medullary blood flow, which of course accounts for less than 5% of the total blood flow. Number second is the vasorecta that we have discussed. These vasorecta plays an important role as the counter current exchangers and these minimizes the solute potentials that we discussed in the very very previous slide, previous lectures that uh, from the proximal tubules to, towards the collecting tubules the amount of the sodium in the interstitium varies drastically but at the end of the collecting tubules where uh, in the urine the amount remains the same so this fluctuation is to establish the hyperosmotic conditions in the uh, medullary interstitium. So the counter current mechanism plays a very important function over here. You can see that the blood will enter uh, and leaves the medulla by the way of vasorecta at the boundary of the both cortex at the cortex and the medulla. The vasorecta are the like other capillaries. Of course, they are highly permeable to both solutes in the blood and the uh, water, except for the plasma proteins moving to their sizes. As the blood moves down, the so more and more solute is being added, so it will increase the osmolarity. And as it moves down, uh, the solutes are being entered into the blood, but water are being reabsorbed, uh, are being taken out, it will further uh, increase the osmolarity. And as at the tip of the medullary portions uh, in the vasorecta, the osmolarity reaches to 1200 milliosmos per liter. As it moves upward through the ascending loop of Henle, this osmolarity decreases because the water is being reabsorbed into the blood and solutes they are being taken out, which have been taken in in the descending loop of Henle. Descending loop of Henle. 
so as the blood as the blood ascends back towards upward and uh, towards the corticular portion or towards the cortex it progressively becomes less concentrated as because the solutes are diffusing out at this particular case uh, into the medullary interstitium and waters they are moving back in the blood in the vasorector now this uh, explains the summary of the urine concentrating mechanisms and the changes in the osmolarity that occurs th th or throughout the different segments in the tubule so in the pr proximal tubule osmolarity doesn't change in the loop of Henle, the osmolarity increases to a particular limit and then decreases. Now, this increase up to around 1200 uh, is during the portion of what happens from the descending loop of Henle and in the very beginning of descending loop of Henle. Now, this decrease is because of the reabsorption of the solutes from the thick ascending portion of the Henle. Uh, which basically accounts for again I am uh, sharing the, it with you that 25% of the total reabsorption so it again decreases to about its initial position uh, to about 300 to 200 milliosmoles so when passing through the distal tubules the osmolarity doesn't change much the earlier distinct tubules where the diluting would be occurring because the water is going to be uh, taking uh, some role in that particular phase in the lateral distal tubules, of course, the in, it will be increased. Uh, it will be increased as occurs in the corticular and the medullary portions. This increase in this uh, this increase of the solute osmolarity in the medullary portion is because of the action of the antidiuretic hormones. Because the distal tubule and the collecting tubules. Uh, will have an action of the antidiuretic hormones on themselves which will of course cause the retention of the water reabsorption of the water from tubules and hence it will increase the osmolarity yeah, when the ADH will be occurring so uh, so to retain the water as much as the body can in the presence of the water deficient uh, conditions so let's discuss the disorder of the urinary concentrating ability uh, either it can occur as a result of improper secretion of the antidiuretic hormones uh, in this particular case scenario either too much or too less concentrations of the ADH are released uh, and both of these will result in abnormal fluid handlings by the kidneys the other thing can be the impairment of the countercurrent mechanisms. Now, in this particular uh, situation, what happens is that the uh, a hyperosmotic medullary, because it's an established fact that the hyperosmotic medullary interstitium is required for the maximum urine concentration ability. So, if there is some disorders or malfunctions that uh, the kidney or the renal medullary portions cannot establish uh, the hyperosmotic conditions they will not be able to retain uh, the water because the water won't be able to move through the osmosis from low to high solute potential so water will be excreted in the form of uh, dilute urine so in that particular scenario no much how much adh is present because the hyperosmotic conditions are not being re-established so water won't be able to reabsorb back the third scenario is the inability of the distal tubule, number one, the collecting tubules, number two, and the collecting ducts to respond to ADH. In this particular scenario, because ADH occur, acts on the V2 receptors on, um, present in these three portions, so uh, under uh, different circumstances, uh, if let's say the, the these two these receptors these V2 receptors let's say are if they are destroyed uh, they won't be able to you know act upon by the action of the antidiuretic hormones so no matter how much antidiuretic hormones are being secreted uh, they won't be able to act upon these portions and hence uh, urine will be produced in very dilute quantities up to 15 liters a day so uh, two situations will arise one is the central diabetes uh, one is known as the central diabetes insipidus now this is uh, the, the result of failure to produce adh now the antidiuretic hormone uh, is responsible for the retaining of water and now uh, when 
the posterior, posterior pituitary of the hypothalamus won't be able to produce antidiuretic hormones, a huge amount of urine will be produced. And this huge amount of urine production uh, can uh, go up to as long as 15 liters a day. And this is because no anti-ADH hormones is produced. Uh, so no, uh, because no ADH is produced, so water retention won't be uh, acting. There would be very low amount of water to be retained. So amount of urine would be in abundant quantities up to 15 liters. Now this can remain normal as long as a particular person uh, with this particular uh, disease, central diabetes insipidus, is intaking abundant quantities of fluid. Now, uh, this particular decrease or failure in the ADH production can occur as a result of severe head injury, it can occur as a result of uh, some infection or it can be congenital as well. So in order to you know, minimize its effect, uh, the drug uh, commonly known uh, the drug which is basically an analog of uh, ADH, synthetic analog of ADH also known as demopressin is being given. Now this demopressin basically acts on the V2 receptors of the ADA uh, of, the pro of the distal tubules and the collecting tubules and functions to reabsorb water. So within some amount of time, a uh, person is able to you know, retain water as this particular analog is being administered. Uh, another disease known as nephrogenic diabetes insipidus is basically the inability of the kidney to respond to ADH. Now ADH is being present, it's being even secreted, but uh, there are some dysfunctions of the kidneys uh, under which ADH, uh, the ADH which is being secreted is not being responded. So in this particular scenario as well, a huge abundant quantities of ADH are being released. Now this occurs due to a variety of reasons and this is not the topic of discussions over here. So we are going to discuss, uh, of course, its causes in some other cases. So let's discuss about the OSPO receptors and the ADH feedback mechanism. So it's basically an overview and summary of what we have discussed in this lecture. Water deficiency occurs in uh, when the water deficiency will occur. It will of course uh, increase the extracellular osmolarity. The solute potential will of course increase and the water potential will decrease. It will this decrease and increase respectively will be de detected by the osmoreceptors. These osmoreceptors they are located in the anterior hypothalamus. Uh, I'm going to over here in the interior hypothalamus. Uh, near the supraptonic near neuron. Now, what they will do is that they will increase the ADA secretion from the posterior pituitary of the hypothalamus. This in turn will release the uh, antidiuretic hormones in the plasma. Their production will increase. The water permeability will of course increase and the water reabsorption will be increased. After the water reabsorption will increase, less amount of water will be decreased. So when the less amount of water will be decreased, it will send a negative signal uh, to the uh, initial water deficit because the water is uh, water excretion has been down reg regulated. So the water storage is at the minimum state, minimal uh, stage, optimum stage. So this optimum stage will send signal that the water is not uh, in deficient quantities. So the posterior anterior pituitary won't be able to send signal to the posterior pituitary that you have to secrete the antidiuretic hormones. Um, I'm going to discuss uh, in a very brief overview about these points we have discussed, but let's read through it. An increase in the extracellular osmolarity causes Spatial nerve cells cause osmoreceptor cells located in the anterior pituitary near the uh, supraoptic uh, nuclei to shrink. Now this shrinkage uh, of the osmoreceptors will cause them to fire the action potential. The nerve signals will be transmitted to this particular nuclei which will of course relay these signals 
from the anterior to the posterior pituitary. Now these action potentials are fired and they are conducted to the posterior pituitary which will of course send signal to the release of ADH which is stored in the secretory granules of the nerve endings. This ADH of course will enter into the bloodstream where it will be transported into the kidney and over kidney it will functions to increase the water permeability of late distal tubular portions and the uh, collecting duct, cortical uh, collecting tubules and the medullary collecting ducts. When the water permeability will be increased, the water will be moving inside and the water reabsorption will take place, resulting in the formation of concentrated urine. Now you can see over here, these are the osmoreceptors. As you can see, these are the baroreceptors, uh, baroreceptors of the cardiopulmonary receptors. They are also send signals, uh, the baroreceptors, which will be determining, de detecting the blood pressure, the cardiopulmonary receptors, which will be determining the pressure and the volume as well. They will be sending signals to the osmoreceptors. These are the uh, signals. These are the supraoptic neurons. They will be sending signals to the anterior lobe of the pituitary uh, the, and the posterior lobe of the pituitary. These posterior lobe of the pituitary will release the vesicles that will be containing antidiuretic hormones. This will be, uh, this antidiuretic hormone will move from the blood, enters into the pl uh, blood plasma from, enter from the blood plasma to the kidney. Over kidney it will of course uh, act on the distal portions of the distal portions of the tubules to the corticular and the medullary collecting ducts and hence the urine uh, will be formed in a very concentrated manner. So the cardiovascular reflex systems there are atrial baroreceptors reflected reflexes and there are cardiopulmonary reflexes. We discussed both of these receptors as baroreceptors and the cardiopulmonary receptors in this slide. Uh, they will of course uh, be functioning uh, in response to the alteration in the osmolarity uh, uh, and they will cause the secretion of the ADH. Along in addition to increased osmolarity, to other, there are two other stimuli that results in the increased ADH secretion and that is number one the decreased atrial pressure and decreased blood volume. So over here you can see the table that basically in, uh, explains uh, the uh, increased ADH under what conditions ADH will secretion will be increased and under what conditions ADH will be decreased. So uh, the ADH concentration will be increased when the plasma osmolarity is greater that is high solute potential. The blood volume is low along with the blood pressure is low uh, of course in case of the nausea and in case of the hypoxia where very limited amount of oxygen is present and the drugs that basically increase the uh, secretion of the ADH uh, includes these morphine, nicotine and cyclophosphamide. Those uh, mechanisms that decrease the secretion of the ADH includes if the plasma osmolarity is low. Plasma osmolarity is low it means that there is excessive amount of water so there is no need to retain water to restore water so the kidney uh, will form very dilute urine. When the blood volume will be high of course when uh, the plasma osmolarity is high it means that excessive water is present so it will of course increase the blood volume as well and it will increase, a uh, increase the blood pressure as well. So alcohol and these dopamine blocker and the antihypertensive drugs, they play a very important role in decreasing the ADH secretion. Now let's discuss the uh, very final, we have reached to the very final portions of the, our lecture. We will discuss how the role play an important role in controlling the osmolarity and the sodium concentration. So the increased thirst will only be occurring when there is increase in osmolarity. This means that the water concentration is low. So there is a need for the body to intake water. Blood volume and, and blood pressure is low and the angiotensin is high. Of course, the dryness of the mouth. The decreased thirst will be occurring uh, when the osmolarity is low. It means that the body has excessive amount of water. The blood volume is high and the blood pressure is high and the angiotensin is low. And this occurs in the case of gastric distension. So in this lecture we discussed uh, 
about how the kidney excrete water by for, uh, by forming dilute urines and we discussed the renal mechanisms for excreting dilute urine we discussed hyperosmotic conditions we discussed the various factors that are important uh, to contribute in the establishments of the hyperosmotic conditions and what are the steps basically uh, which generate and establish the hyperosmotic conditions of the renal medullary interstitium after that we discussed uh, the urea contribution how uh, the urea contribute how the increased production how the increased uh, concentration of the urea basically contributes towards the establishment of the hyperosmotic conditions of the renal medullary interstitium we discussed uh, the feedback mechanisms of the osmoreceptors that are uh, present uh, which send signals to the posterior pituitary to release adh hormones and it's a negative feedback regulation uh, we discussed the synthesis of ADH and how they are being released uh, from uh, special receptors after that particular receptors receive signals uh, both from uh, the anterior pituitary and from the better receptors and the cardiopulmonary receptors. Finally, we discussed uh, the cardiovascular reflex stimulation and the release of the ADH and we discussed uh, what uh, role thirst plays uh, to control the extracellular fluid osmolarity and uh, to control the concentration of sodium in the interstitium. Now that is all for this lecture. Uh, thank you for watching and for more lectures keep watching scardia.com.